And this morning I've entitled what I want to share to set this series off, which I trust will act as a, an introduction for further teaching on this subject. I've entitled what I want to share with you, Looking into the Future. Looking into the Future. And if you'll turn with me to your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read a few verses from verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning to read from verse 16. Peter writes, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to take heed, as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that you'll bless your word to us. We pray, Spirit of God, that you'll enlighten truth this morning. And that, Lord, if there are those here who do not know you as their Savior, we are praying salvation will come to this house today. We are praying that people will be saved in this meeting this morning. And God, we pray for every one of us who love your name, who believe in you, we pray that we'll be stirred in our spirits to serve the Lord in this generation we live in. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It could be truly stated, friends, that we are living in a generation. We find ourselves alive at a time that is the worst of times, and it is also the best of times. It's the best of times because the church of Jesus Christ is growing at a phenomenal rate. Isaiah the prophet, he spoke of a day when darkness would cover the face of the earth and gross darkness would be upon all the lands and all the people. But he spoke prophetically of the Israel of God, the church of Jesus Christ, and said that the light would shine upon us and the glory of God would come upon us, and the darkness would not affect us. I read a very interesting article um, about three or four weeks ago, and I want to share it with you now. It, it, it was posted on the World Net at, uh, on the 31st of December at 11.30 p.m., and it's entitled, Christianity is Taking Over the Planet. What is the fastest growing religion on earth? Most news report, reports suggest it is Islam. But the evidence suggests a new or perhaps original form of biblically inspired evangelical Christianity is sweeping through places like China, Africa, India, and Southeast Asia, making it by far the fastest growing faith on the planet. In Megashift, author Jim Rutz coins a new phrase to define this fast growing segment of the population. He calls them core apostolics, or the new saints who are at the heart of the mushrooming kingdom of God. Rutz makes the point that Christianity is often overlooked as the fastest growing faith in the world because most surveys look at the traditional Protestant denominations and the Roman Catholic Church while ignoring Christian believers who have no part of either. He says there are 707 million switched on disciples of Christ who fit into this new category and that this church is exploding in growth. The growing core of Christianity crosses theological lines 
and, in, and includes 707 million born-again people who are increasing by 8% a year. He says, so fast is this group growing that under current trends, according to Roots, the entire world will be composed of such believers by the year 2032. There will be pockets of resistance and unforeseen breakthroughs, writes Roots, still at the rate we are growing now. To be comically precise, there would be more Christians than people by the autumn of 2032. About 8.2 billion. Hallelujah. The church is growing, folks. The kingdom of God is growing. Jesus Christ is building his church. And the world is feeling the effects. We may not see it here in the West, but I want to tell you there is phenomenal growth that is taking place through on planet Earth. It's also the worst of times. World events such as political upheaval, famine, escalating disasters on the Earth, environmental pollution, they're all causing great cause for concern. Friends, I want to say this morning, the days that we find ourselves living in, they are unrivaled in the history of mankind. Listen to how God's Word describes these days. There will be signs in the sun and in the moon, in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing from fear, at the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. I want to say we are living in those days. Australia, at the back end of last year, and the beginning of the new year, had floods that were unrivaled in its history. I phoned my daughter up. She was in Queensland over the Christmas period. She said, we have not been able to get out. The rain hasn't stopped. That was just the beginning. And it kept raining. And the waters kept rising. And it seems staggering to imagine it, friends. But floods covered Australia as big as Germany and France put together. Such was the vast extent of land that was covered. Only this week, another cyclone has hit Australia and devastated many, much of that part of the country. The Middle East is like a boiling cauldron. Egypt. has now got their people on the streets. Followed the example of Tunisia. It's spreading into Jordan. Many of the Middle East countries are just at boiling point. And every day we see it on our TV screens. Israel is still the center of the world's attention. Continual unrest in Israel. I pulled some statistics off the computer this morning. It's talking about natural disasters in 2011. We're not very far into 2011, but this was a recap of the first 12 days of January in the world that we are living in. January the 1st, an earthquake of the magnitude of 6.9 hits Argentina. January the 1st, earthquake magnitude 5.2, southern Xinjiang in China. January the 2nd, a magnitude of 7.1 earthquake hits Chile. January the 2nd, more than 1,000 dead birds fall from the sky in Arkansas. January the 2nd, Dead fish cover 20-mile section of a Kansas River. January the 3rd, Uganda, yellow fever outbreak 
kills more than 40. January the 3rd, earthquake near Japan triggers a tsunami warning. January the 3rd, powerful earthquake hits southeast Iran. January the 3rd, earthquake 7.0 magnitude hits northern Argentina. January the 3rd, hundreds of dead blackbirds found in Louisiana. January the 3rd, ten thousands, tens of thousands of birds found dead in Manitoba. January the 3rd, thousands of birds fall from the sky in South America. January the 3rd, a major flood in Rock, Rockhampton, Australia. January the 4th, dead birds found in Kentucky. January the 4th, hundreds of Tons of dead fish wash up on the Brazilian shorelines. January the 5th, hundreds of dead birds found in East Texas. January the 5th, dead birds in Sweden. Millions of dead fish in Maryland, Brazil and New Zealand. January the 5th, the shift of Earth's magnetic North Pole affects Tampa Airport. January the 6th, 40,000 crabs found dead on the beaches in England. Did you hear about that? January the 6th, heavy flu floods leave at least 35 dead in Brazil. January the 12th, earthquake of 4.5 magnitude hits California. January the 12th, huge waves destroy homes in eastern Indonesia. 12 days into a new year. And our planet, friends, is greatly affected. It was mentioned last year that natural disasters last year, they killed 295,000 people. 295,000 people last year lost their lives through natural disasters. You know, we've just read there what Jesus said about the end of times. He talked about the sea and the waves roaring. And every one of us perhaps here have witnessed one of the biggest disasters ever to hit mankind, when that tsunami in the Indian Ocean took everything in front of it. Over 160,000 people lost their lives. Millions of people were left homeless, and it destroyed whole communities. When it hit land, it swept everything in front of it. It was traveling at 500 miles an hour. Jesus said, the sea and the waves will be roaring. There's a phrase that often occurs in the Bible. It's the phrase, the last days. I want you to understand what it's referring to. It's referring to the time in between Christ's going back into heaven and his coming again. That period from his ascension to the time he will come back again is referred to in the Bible as the last days. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, on that great sermon he, that he preached, he said, it shall come to pass in the last days. God will pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. The apostles talked about the last days. Peter mentions it time and time again in his writings about the last days. I want to suggest, friends, for over 2,000 years now, the world has been living in the last days. And I want to suggest we find ourselves living today in the last of the last days. I want to tell you, friends, things are coming to a conclusion. The final curtain is about to come down. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, In the last days, perilous times shall come. That word is the Greek word chelpos, perilous times, chelpos. It, it means harsh times, savage times, grievous, hard to deal with, difficult times, painful, fierce times will come upon the earth. In the last days, perilous times will come. The word describes a, a society that is barren of virtue, but abounding with vices. Paul declares that will be, people will be characterized in these days by all kinds of self-centeredness and unnatural perversions. 
Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Men who have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. Friends, if we are living in the last days, or the last of the last days, then we are a people today who find ourselves living upon, we are people who are living at the ends of the age. We find ourselves alive at the ends of the age. We are the first generation to really live with the possibility that we could be well alive when the final curtain comes down. There has never been a day quite like this day. That's why it's unrivaled in the history of the world. There's a growing fear among the world's inhabitants that the days of life on earth, they seem to be numbered. That realization first began to dawn upon mankind when we heard of or we, we saw, some of us were alive, I wasn't, but some of you here were, when that bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And suddenly the fear of a whole population and a whole civilization, in fact an entire world being wiped out by nuclear power, it began to surface. Through the 60s and the 70s and 80s, we, we lived on the edge as Russia and America many times had their fingers on the button ready to press it to launch a nuclear holocaust upon this world. In recent years, that fear seems to have been overtaken by the threat not of nuclear destruction, but by another threat, the fear of environmental pollution, natural pollution, and man-made pollution. Last year we watched as that BP plant in the middle of the ocean was oozing out oil for months, weeks and months on end before they could get it stemmed. Isaiah talks about the world being polluted under the feet of its inhabitants. Friends, we are living in a time when there is tremendous fear that the world is running out of steam. There have been two severe droughts in the Amazonian rainforests in the last five years. You know that the Amazonian rainforests, they're, they're the lungs of the world. They produce the CO2 that we, we breathe. But because of these droughts, instead of Many trees have been killed, millions of them. And instead of the Amazonian rainforest being the lungs of the world, producing the CO2, they now tell us that they will, they will, they, they will produce it as much as America. The pollution. The pollution in the, in the, in the rainforest will be as much as what America has. We are living in dire straits. And as we look into the future, we oftentimes wonder what it might hold. How do we face it? Because every one of us here are going to face the future. There are those who live whose only concern is for the day. They're forgetful. They try and forget what's going to happen in the future. They have that type of attitude of, well, what will be, will be. Their policy is let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we might die. That's one extreme. On the other hand, there are, there's more interest in the future and efforts to change it taking place on planet Earth today than ever before. 
everyone from politicians to scientists to the man in the street seems to be getting involved in it. We've had the global treaties save our planet. The environmentalists who are looking into the future and telling us we must do this. The greenhouse effect, the, the, the global warming. We, we've got to do this. We've got to put this in place because of what's going to happen in the future. There's a lot of interest in what's going to happen in the future in a lot of circles. And so as we look into the future, attitudes swing widely from elevated optimism to extreme pessimism, from faith to fatalism. Broadly speaking, friends, there are three ways in which one can pierce the veil that hides the future from us. The first is a very popular one. It's gaining in popularity more and more. It's an ancient one. It's been here from time memorial. There are many people turning to the occult or to superstitious means to foretell what's going to happen in the future. Hollywood have made their blockbuster movies on it. This ancient practice of divination, I want to say, friends, it's still very much alive. It's been practiced by clairvoyants, mediums, people who have been gazing into crystal balls, those who use the Ouija board, tarot cards, tea leaves, you name it. People are gazing into the future. There's a tremendous interest in the occult. Six out of ten men and seven out of ten women read their horoscopes every day in newspapers and magazines. And no popular magazine, no newspaper would dare to leave from its print the stars. The media, TV and radio, they give prominent airtime to the astrologers and to those who predict the future. Russell Grant was once popular. He, he became a well-known name. I want to tell you there's a lot of well-known names now. People who are involved on our TVs and on the airwaves predicting what's going to happen in the future. Yet despite of the huge popularity of the occult, it is estimated that these channels are no more, listen to this, are no more than 5% accurate. Putting it another way, that means they're 95% wrong. 95% mistaken. Friends, only those who are willing or wanting to be deceived forget the errors and their focus on the few fulfillments. What does God have to say about this method of looking into the future? Let me tell you, he's got plenty to say. He's not silent. God is not silent, friends, about people who use this method to look into the future. Listen to what the Word of God says. He says, For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out before you. You will be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations, this is what he said to Israel, which you will dis dispossess, they listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God says, you are not appointed for such things. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. For I am the Lord your God. The person who turns after mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. 
I'm going to tell you, friends, God sets his face against them. And anyone who practices them, God sets his face against them. And I don't know everyone here this morning, and I don't know your situations, but I want to say, if you are dabbling in the occult, if you are hung up and reading your horoscopes to find out what's going to happen in the future, friends, can I say very kindly, stop it. Because God is setting his face against you. God says it's an abomination unto him. When they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Even one of God's champions, King Saul, the Bible says died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance. And he did not inquire of the Lord. Friends, God's got plenty to say about this means of looking into the future. The second method that's used is the scientific approach. Deduction from observation is the basic tool of modern science. To calculate present trends and project them into the future. This is a trend or a method known as futurology. Global warming, the environment, the conservationists, they would all come into this category of the futurologists. It also affects the world of technology, industry, commercial and political spheres, who all have their think tanks, who look at present trends and project them into the future. And people are paid huge amounts of money, huge wages to do it, to be the think tank, to look into the future and to see what's going to happen. Friends, more than one computer has calculated the likely date for the end of the world through this method as 2000, as the year 2040. More than one computer. They have come to that conclusion by taking into account the population growth, food and energy resources, and environmental decay. The results that have been published so far by this method of futurology have revealed around about 25% of the predictions that have made by futurologists have been accurate. Another way to look at it, 75% mistaken. And if you take into account the 25% of things that futurologists have said are going to come to pass, they're not things that have been predicted 50 years down the road. They're just short-term predictions. Friends, it's easier to predict what's going to happen a year from now than 50 years from now. And most of the 25% of predictions that futurologists have said come into this sphere of short-term predictions and not long-term. So we've got the occult. We've also got the futurologists. The third method of looking into the future is the scriptural method. It's the Bible. Friends, declaration about what's going to happen in the future is a major feature of the Bible. How many know the Bible is God's word to mankind? It is the living word of God himself. Many times we read, in fact, 3,808 times we read, Thus says the Lord. 
It is the only book where God speaks. And in the Bible, 3,808 times, we have a direct word from God. Friends, let me tell you, there is only one person who knows the future, and that's God himself. That's why he is called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God knows the future. Over a quarter of the verses in the Bible, they contain a prediction about the future. Just think of it. A quarter of the verses in your Bible contain a prediction about future events. Altogether, there are some 737 separate forecasts made in the Bible concerning future events. Some are only mentioned once, while others are mentioned hundreds of times. Of these 737 forecasts, predictions about the future, friends, I want to say this morning that 594 have come to pass already. That is over 80% have already come true. The remaining 143 predictions are speaking about things that will take place at the end of the world, which is to come. If we take into account the 594 forecasts, the prophecies that have been made, remember we've read this morning we have a more sure word of prophecy, the word of God. If we take into account the 540, nine, 594 forecasts of prophecy that have already come true concerning the, the predictions that have made, been made, the Bible has achieved 100% accuracy. That gives us tremendous confidence to believe that the, the rest, the, the, the 143 that have yet to be fulfilled, it gives us confidence that they will be fulfilled. For those who might be interested, I've quoted st statistics there from the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy by J. Barton Payne, published by Hodder and Stroughton in 1973. And every prediction that the Bible gives can be found there with the, the answers or the, 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 the coming to pass of what the Bible has said. With such overwhelming accuracy of Scripture, when it comes to looking into the future, I think it's outstanding. In fact, I think it beggars belief that people would rather c consult satanic rigmarole or human reason rather than divine revelation we have a sure word of prophecy friends let me tell you on the authority of god's word his word will come to pass there will not one i ought or not one thing fall to the ground what god has said about the future will happen to the exact minute detail of what he says we can trust the Word of God. God. God's Word to us makes the future very plain. In fact, we are in a very privileged position this morning because we know things about the future that presidents and kings and those in high authority don't know about. They're consulting the futurologists, saying what's going to happen. Whereas believers, we consult the Word of God. The Bible says God has revealed these things to, the, to, the, to, 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 to babes. He's hidden them from the wise and the prudent, and He's revealed them unto babes. What a privilege we have this morning. Friends, that this future, that this world that we're living in, God has mapped out in His Word the future for us. And if we will study the Scriptures, if we will seek God, then we will get a clear picture of the things that the future holds. 
Some things will begin to emerge about the many things that are predicted in the Word of God. Things of a personal nature, a political nature, a social, an environmental, a moral nature. All these things are predicted here in the Word of God. But there is one event that stands out above them all. The return to this world of a person who lived 2,000 years ago. A carpenter from the village of Nazareth who claimed to be God in the flesh. Divine as well as human. Rejected by an unbelieving world. Friends, the day is coming when he will be vindicated and every eye will see him. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The second coming of Jesus Christ is an event that is more frequently predicted than any other in the Bible. The question, what is the world coming to, is being asked by millions of people today. Let me tell you, friends, that question should be changed to, not what is the world coming to, but who is coming to this world? Because I want to tell you on the authority of the Word of God, history will be brought to a conclusion, not by the pressing of a button that will launch some nuclear attack, but by the breaking of a scroll in heaven, on which is already written the countdown of world events. And at the climax, Jesus himself will reappear on the world stage to take personal control of the grand finale. Hallelujah. The return of Jesus Christ is given plain and central place by the church. It's repeatedly, it's repeatedly quoted in the, in, the equi, in the creeds. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, include it as a fundamental part of what we believe as believers. Every Sunday, when we break bread, it is a remembrance that one day, as Alan shared with us this morning, Jesus is coming again. I will not drink this until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Friends, he said, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself. When they watched him go, the angel of the Lord stood by them and said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. Let me tell you, he's coming again. He's coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him. And those who pierced him will look upon him and mourn because of him. In truth, friends, the vast majority of Christians neglect this vital truth. In some churches, you never hear it mentioned, the coming again of the Lord. In some churches, you never hear it preached about. And yet, the second coming of Christ is fundamental to our Christian faith. The days that we are living in, they demand that we are wide awake and alert. We are looking for that blessed hope. Men and women who can discern the signs of the times and the events that are happening in the world. And when we do discern them, we lift up our heads because the Word of God tells us these things will take place. And we can lift up our heads because we know that our redemption is drawing nigh. The King is coming. We should be living with a tremendous sense of of readiness. The Bible says, lest coming suddenly, he will find you asleep. It's time to wake up. It's time to seek the Lord. The bridegroom is coming, and the call has gone out to the church. Wake up. Go out to meet him. Get ready for his coming. Friends, the hour is late. It's never been as late. The Bible says, now is our salvation nearer. 
than when we first believed. And the reason for this message on the end times is for us just to stir up our minds by way of reminding ourselves the truth of the Word of God, of the things that are most surely believed amongst us. Friends, we believe that Jesus is coming again. The Word of God predicts it. 594 predictions about the future have already come to pass. The rest of the 147 will come to pass. Praise God. And friends, a lot of them are centered around this figure, this, this man, this God-man, who will return to this earth again, whose name is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We believe that Christ died. He was buried. The third day, He rose again from the dead. And He's coming again. That is His promise. And He never broke a promise. Peter writes, seeing then that all these things must shortly be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be? In our conduct, in our conversation, in the way that we live our lives, what manner of persons ought we to be? As we look into the future, friends, we do so not with dread or fear, but with a confident hope. I can remember singing many, many years ago a song. It was, I know I'll see Jesus someday. I know I'll see Jesus someday. What a joy it will be when His face I shall see. I know I'll see Jesus someday. Friends, we are living in unrivaled days. May we so live our lives that we will not be ashamed before Him at His coming. The next time we share together will be the end of the month, which will be a, a guest service. Uh, and I just want to encourage you to invite some friends along, to invite new people along to that end of the month guest service. When will be the, the title of my message then will be caught up to meet Him. Caught up to meet Him. Talking about the rapture. When the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Unless, of course, he comes in the meantime. But to be ready. To be ready.